Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Alec, and I'm going to be here today to help answer any of your general or technical questions that you may have. But before we get started, I'd like to cover a couple of things you need to know about the session today. There's no dial-in number for today's event. All audio will be streamed to you through your computer speakers or headphones. So if you're hearing me now, you should be fine. And remember to adjust your volume accordingly. You can submit questions for today's speaker or any technical issues you may encounter by clicking on the Q&A icon located on the right-hand side of your screen labeled here with this top arrow. Click that icon, type your question in, and click Submit. You can submit any time during today's presentation. If it's a content-related question, we may pull it during the Q&A se session if time allows. If it's a technical question, I'll have an answer for you that will appear on your screen shortly after you submit your question. You can download a PDF of the slide deck right now on the right-hand side of your screen by clicking the handouts icon labeled here with this bottom arrow. Just click there and you should be able to follow or download a PDF to take notes and follow along today. Today's webinar is being recorded. You're going to receive a link to that recording and a follow-up email, so please allow at least a business day before that information is sent. In that same email, you're going to have a link to the PDF of the slides, as well as your HRCI and SHRM certification information from today's event. That email will come from that email will come from HCM Events. So keep your eyes on that. All right. So today, it's our pleasure to have with us Angela Smuziak from Adobe. Angela has contributed to the transformation of Adobe's strategy and approach to managing and developing its global workforce. She was a key contributor and thought leader to the elimination of the global annual review process and redesign and implementation of the more flexible, lighter weight check-in approach. So like I said, it's our pleasure to have Angela here as you can see her there on your screen. So Angela, let's go ahead and get started. Great, thank you so much and hello everyone. As said, I'm Angela Arvizu Smuziak, and I'm really excited to share with you Adobe's check-in approach. Check-in is really fundamental to strong management and foundational to effective leadership. And this allows us to lead, grow, and scale our business and to build leaders for the future. Our most important asset and investment is our people and how we're leading them, how we're aligning their work, and how we're allowing them to make their greatest contribution to support our business. Now, I'm not trying to sell you on check-in, but really to give you a case study of what is possible so that you can be inspired to ask the questions that will help you to determine how to evolve your people and leadership practices to better drive business results and impact. So a little bit of a disclaimer, check-in is by no means perfect, but, it is significantly better than any annual performance review process ever could be. And it's what makes sense for us, given our culture, our business, our rhythms, our leadership, and our management bench. So as we get started today, I would like to take a poll to get a sense of what your familiarity is with Adobe's products and employment brand. So you see a poll there, and we'd love you to take this poll to let us know how familiar are you with Adobe's products, business, and our brand. So we'd love to see uh, what it is here, how familiar you are, or maybe you've never heard of Adobe. Just give me a great sense of knowing kind of where we are there. Okay, hopefully you've all had the chance to vote. We could see the results now. Angela, the results are still coming in a little bit. Uh, let's give it a couple more seconds. Okay, not a problem. Okay, so let's see. So many of you are fairly familiar. Um, some of you have heard of Adobe but don't know too much. Um, and at least nobody said that they, that does Adobe make bricks and, and build houses. <laughs> I guess 1% of you did. Well, maybe you have a great sense of humor. All right. Well, let me give you some context then about our business. So first of all, Adobe is changing the world through digital experiences. And through the last six years, we have gone through a significant business transformation, shifting from an individual box software product um, where we now have moved everything to a subscription model and in the cloud. 
This was a significant shift that really required an overhaul of our business models, our processes, our infrastructure, and really the skill sets of many of our employees. And this business transformation was the backdrop for some changes that we made in our people practices. So you may have heard this before, experiences matter more than ever. And that's whether you're buying a cup of coffee or even buying an outfit online. It's all about the experience. And we are doing this by empowering people to create and transforming how businesses compete. And there's three main cloud solutions that we have. We have the Creative Cloud. Some of you may know our, some of our products here, like Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator for Creative Pros. We also have the Document Cloud, which includes Acrobat, PDF, and Adobe Sign. And then finally, the Experience Cloud. And this is our, our cloud product that helps enterprises to really build campaigns, manage their advertising, and gain deep intelligence about their business performance. And all of this is underlined with Adobe Sensei, which is where we're applying artificial intelligence and machine learning to enrich the experience. So we are about almost about 19,000 employees globally. Last year, we celebrated 35 years in business, and we are approaching $8 billion in annual revenue. So as I said, experience matters, but not just for our customers. We think really deeply about the employee experience. And at the core of our company is really our core values. This is what I call our DNA or often our secret sauce, being genuine, exceptional, innovative, and involved. And for years, Adobe has really been seen as a great place to work. And we want to ensure that our people practices are really in alignment with allowing us to have the greatest business success but also supporting our employees' success. So let me take you back now to 2012. We were going through these significant business changes and we were shifting our legacy business to the cloud with a subscription business model. And we were also adding this new business called digital marketing at the time. And it really required a different mindset, a different form of leadership and a lot of different infrastructure. So with such a significant business transformation and a very highly skilled yet very distributed workforce, we found that the old, bloated, archaic annual performance review process was not working for us. It took valuable time away from our business goals and it did not allow us to move quick enough. So it was time to think boldly and quickly. So I'd like to ask you, where are you on your performance management journey? So are you making changes in your performance process? So we're going to bring up a poll here so I can get a sense of where each of you are in your journey. So some of you may have a traditional annual, per, annual performance review process and you're happy with it. Some may feel that you have that, but you need or want to do something different. Um, some of you may be in the process of adopting a new performance management approach. Some of you may have already implemented something, but you're not quite satisfied. And some of you may have a new approach and you're happy with it. So we'd love to know where you are in this journey. Okay, so uh, let's see the greatest percentage here is you're in the process of adopting a new performance management approach. So you're already on that journey and making some changes. Great, I hope you get some ideas here that can inspire you on where to go and um, how to move forward. So let me tell you a bit about our journey. So Donna Morris, who was our executive vice president of what we call customer and employee experience. Back in 2012, we had tried everything to overhaul, nuance, change, shift, improve our annual, annual performance review process, and it just wasn't working. So Donna said, enough is enough. We are done. The annual performance review process is gone. However, we did not have a plan B. So what we decided to do was to invite our leaders, our managers, and our employees to help us co-architect the new approach. So we used social media. Donna went on to our internal global learning blog and asked our employees to help us create the future. 
So we asked questions like, what did you like about the old annual review process? And what should we keep? What didn't you like about the process? Which was a lot. Um, and how could it be different? Like, it's all whiteboard. Give us your ideas. Give us your thoughts. And everyone in the company globally, from the top to the bottom of the organization, had the chance to weigh in, either by the blog or by a private email. And we were pleasantly surprised on how much feedback we got. Thousands and thousands of hits to the blog, hundreds and hundreds of comments and personal emails, because as we all know, this is something that affects everybody. And we even had a couple engineers that spent a weekend creating an algorithm on how to quantify feedback. So it was something that many of our employees were very vested in and were willing to share their insights. So we took that feedback, and we put it into themes and recommendations, and we went to our executive team. And we told them that the new approach was not going to belong to HR, but was going to belong to the business as a way for them to manage and accelerate business results. So their active involvement was really crucial. After that meeting, we then went and had focus groups with senior leaders, and then we had more focus groups with managers, and then additional focus groups with employees to test our direction. Then we returned back to the blog and we told everyone, thank you so much for your feedback. Here are the key themes that we heard. Here are some high level decisions that have been made in the direction that we're going but we'd like your thoughts and your reactions. So please give us your feedback yet again. Now we went through this process over and over, sharing the themes with the executive team, going back to those focus groups with senior leaders, with managers, with employees, then back to the blog. And we went through this multiple times during that summer of 2012. And this process, this very iterative approach, really mirrored our agile software development approach, and it helped us to test our thinking, refine and adjust. And this process of deeply including all of our key stakeholders was really a best practice that served us well. And I think it's one of the reasons why the check-in approach has really been really stable for the last six years. And having been at Adobe for a very long time, I can tell you nothing stays the same for six years. So it's really a testament to the time that we spent on the front end to listen to our leaders and our employees to understand what they wanted and what they needed. Also, as part of this process, we had a cross-functional design team. So there were about 13 of us that included HR business partnering, compensation, systems, employee communications, legal, global representation because what we wanted was a very holistic approach. And we wanted the framework to really align all of our systems and all of our philosophies. And that only comes with having a number of those perspectives at the table. So at the end of the summer, we had our check-in approach. Now we went to our brand marketing team and we wanted to help ask them to help us brand this new approach. So we called it check-in with the tagline of helping our employees to do and be their best each and every day. Now, if you think of the name Adobe and how it's spelled, A-D-O-B-E, you have A-D-O-D-O-B-E-B, -B, to help our employees do and be their best each and every day. And those brand marketing people are just so clever, but it really helped us to brand this new approach. So let me talk you through check-in. It's a really simple model, a very simple approach that I can talk through in probably about 90 seconds or so. First, we have expectations. So ensuring that employees and managers are really clear on what is expected, the goals, the objectives, the milestones, what does success look like, and how do we continue to revise that as our business evolves? Number two, feedback. Ongoing feedback, both constructive and positive, that goes what I call north, south, east, and west, meaning manager to employee, but also employee to manager, as well as east and west, which means colleague to colleague, which is where most of the work happens every day. And then finally, growth and development. And this is to ensure that we are supporting the aspirations of our very talented workforce as well as the changing needs of the business. And that's it. There's no ratings, there's no rankings, 
There's no forced distribution. There's very little process and there's no required documentation. Now, let me share with you some of the underlying principles of design. So first, it had to be very simple and very lightweight. And you've just seen the check-in approach. It's very simple. There's the critical few, the three things that managers and employees should be focusing on. Because sometimes we can make things so complicated and so heavy, and then we wonder why our managers and leaders aren't following our recommendations. So we were challenged consistently through the design process to keep it simple and to keep it lightweight. Next, we needed it to be flexible in both timing and in method. So what does that mean? So our leaders were always asking for more flexibility because annual performance review was always at the wrong time. It was when we were closing a quarter or we were shipping the greatest product in the history of Adobe or it was when we had our biggest conference in Europe. As the saying says, one size fits one. So with check-in, we allow our leaders and our managers to decide what is the rhythm that works for them. So for instance, if you're in finance, you live and breathe by the fiscal calendar, so quarterly is a business rhythm that makes sense. You set objectives, you set expectations at the beginning of the quarter, and then you give feedback on those expectations at the end of the quarter. Maybe you're on an engineering team and they're running on six week sprints. Then they're setting feedback at the beginning of those six weeks and are starting setting expectations at the beginning of those six, six weeks and then giving feedback at the end of those six weeks. So we're letting them decide what is the business rhythm that makes sense for them. We don't want the process to get in the way of the outcome. We want to be really clear what's the outcome that we're trying to get, clear expectations, how you get there is up to you. Okay, now flexibility on method. If they document, they get to choose how. So they get to choose if they want to use um, either PowerPoint or bullet points in a Word document or a third party um, tool, back of a napkin. We don't care. Again, we don't want the process to get in the way of the outcome. We have a standard form for each of those three areas if they want to use that, but we always got feedback, well, we don't like this question or this question should be asked. So we say, okay, you get to decide how. Here's best practices on what we think that process could look like, but you get to choose. Now, I do want to state that if somebody is underperforming, then we do have a very structured, documented performance improvement process to make sure that we're helping to manage them up or if necessarily out of the process or out of the company. But that's for a very small percentage of employees. It's only those that are underperforming. Everyone else would fall under check-in. And that's where they get the opportunity to determine what is the timing and what is the process that works for them. Now, we do highly recommend that they write it down because what I said isn't always what you heard. So writing it down helps us to ensure that there's clarity, but we don't collect it. We don't require it. We tell them that is a best practice. And then we tell them to figure it out on what's going to work for them in order for them to be successful. Another key principle was we wanted to strip out the victim mentality from the process. In the old process, managers felt like they had to give a ranking or a rating that they most of the time didn't approve or didn't necessarily um, recommend. And employees felt that in that, um, rec in, in that conversation, they had no opportunity to really say anything. The decisions had already been made. It wasn't gonna change the review. It wasn't gonna change their money. So there wasn't a conversation at all. They would just sit, listen, and then walk out of the room and update their LinkedIn profile, looking for another job. So we wanted to take away that victim mentality. And what we did was by separating the rewards conversation from that ongoing feedback and expectations conversation, it allowed, it allowed for a much more direct, ongoing, and authentic conversation with them. Another thing we wanted to do was really delegate the ownership of performance management to managers. As we get larger, we can't manage it all, and we give so much responsibility to our managers and our leaders to drive and own their business. People management, performance management, that is part of owning and driving your business. 
So we needed to give that responsibility back to them so they could drive their business. We want to build those leadership capabilities that build that muscle, if you will. So as they continue to grow through the organization, they are taking full ownership and responsibility for their business. We also want to manage to the top of the class, not to the lowest common denominator. So we have set the bar high. We have a lot of expectations for our managers. They should be having these ongoing conversations with their employees throughout the year. Now with annual review process, even though we told them they should have ongoing conversations throughout the year, with competing priorities and wanting to avoid the conversation, they would just snap to only having one conversation a year, the lowest common denominator. So it was an unintentional consequence of the old approach. So we got rid of that and we set the bar high. And what we find is that if you set the bar high, people will usually rise to that. And if they don't, then you either have to help them rise to that, or perhaps they're not in, they're not in the right role and they should not be leading as a manager or as a leader. And then we also set an expectation that this would take at least two to three years. We didn't want the business to think that this would be a one and done, check the box, six months, we'd achieved it. That this would be an iterative process that we would learn as we would go. And that gave us the time and it gave us the opportunity to be able to explore, to feel like it didn't have to be perfect the first time out of the shoot, and to just set that expectation that it was going to take some time. So let's talk a little bit about rewards. because I'm sure that's a question many of you already have in your mind. How in the world do you allocate rewards if you don't have ratings or rankings? So we have what we call rewards check-in once a year, so at the beginning of the year, and that's where we allocate our merit increases, our annual bonuses, as well as a limited equity pool. It's a very lightweight process, and the tool is open for about two weeks at the beginning of the year. Frontline managers have the opportunity to put in their recommendations at the very beginning. They are given a merit budget, they're given their bonus budget, and they can see the salary range for each of their employees in each of the jobs they're in, in each of the locations that they are, where they're located. We also tell them which quartile they fall in. So we're giving them market data as far as where their employees fall according to the market. So with this, Within the tool, we allow managers then to test different scenarios. So if I give more money here, how does that affect my budget? So that they can be trial and error to figure out what's the best way to allocate a limited resource. Now we still have a pay for performance approach. We are not looking for the peanut butter approach where everybody gets the same thing. We are looking for them to use this resource in the best way possible to support the business. In our old approach, we would give them a grid. So we had four levels, high, strong, solid, and low. And in that grid, it would say, if someone is a high, you should, we recommend a six to 8% increase. If someone's a strong, maybe a four to 7% increase. But then that just became an X, Y access exercise. Managers were not thinking of this as a strategic um, allocation of, of thinking of their resources and their people. Plus, we want them to be thinking year round about how they are rewarding their employees. Compensation is an important lever, but there's also things like growth and development, exposure, flexibility. There's lots of things in their toolbox, and we didn't want them to be myopic and just thinking of this as a one-time event without looking at the bigger picture. Again, we're trying to build leaders that are thinking about their business holistically and strategically. So at the beginning, many struggles. They were saying, you know, how can I do this? I liked my grid. Of course, it was simple. It didn't require any thought. But we are looking for leaders. And so we would tell them, here's what you're going to do. You've got your budget. You've got the, the listing of where everyone is when it comes to um, all of the salary ranges. You know where they fall competitively in the market. And if you've been having ongoing conversations, you know what they value comp as well as other things like flexibility, development, exposure, et cetera. And over time, they figured it out. In fact, the second year, we had a lot less requests. It was actually pretty interesting once they realized, okay, this is basically a math exercise. So as we're going through this process, 
our amazing comp team is also looking at the data. So first the manager, frontline managers put in their recommendations, then it rolls up to their manager and their manager and all the way up to their executive vice president who must stay within their budget. As this roll up is happening, the comp team and the HR business pro and the HR business partners are analyzing the data. They're looking for strange anomalies, really high swings or low swings or peanut butter and addressing that before we lock it down. So while managers and leaders have a lot of discretion, there is also oversight to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So one of the things we also do is training for our managers. So during this process, we wanna teach them how to do this. And in that training, we give them examples to help them think through. Okay, so here's Mary. She's in the top four, she's in the fourth top quartile of her salary range. She's a top performer. What would you do? Here's Joe. He's new to the salary range. He's in the second quartile. And what would you do? So what we're trying to do is build that muscle, helping them build the intelligence around how do they do this on their own so they don't need us year after year after year. Now, as I said, there's still a lot of oversight going on in the background to make sure that we are still um, applying our pay for performance mentality. We also have looked at all of our pay parity and at the end of last year, we were really excited that we had achieved gender pay parity in both North America and in India, which represents a combined majority of our employees across the globe. And so we were very excited about that. We also do analysis when it comes to gender, race, and other things to make sure that we're doing the right thing from a comp perspective. So again, we give our managers a lot of discretion, a lot of opportunity to make the right decisions based on their business, based on the market. And we also have oversight in the background to try to make sure that we are being consistent and we are being fair. So how are we measuring the success of check-in? We've now had this process for six years. So what we did in that fall of 2012 is we had an engagement survey because we wanted to get a baseline of where we were starting. And so in that engagement survey, we had questions around, you know, do you, are you getting feedback from your manager? Do you have clear expectations from your manager? Have you had a growth and development conversation recently? And so we're able to gather a lot of insight from that engagement survey. We can see the survey results down to the frontline manager as long as they have at least three or more people on their team who responded to the survey. Then what we do is we look at those survey results and we identify what is the bottom 15% of managers when it comes to those check-in questions. Once we identify who's really struggling, we then work with their manager to get some context. Is it a new manager and they need some training? Is it maybe a manager that's new to that team and that team's been struggling for some time? So we need to make sure that we support that manager as they're being onboarded. Or perhaps um, that team is going through a lot of change and a lot of churn. So we need to provide additional support to them. Or maybe they're just not a good manager and we need to manage them either out of that role or um, manage them up. So we want to understand what is the context and then do the right intervention. The other thing we can do with that data is we can look along the line of leadership. And if we see that there is consistently, let's say red, <laughs> as we go up that chain of command, it could be not just a manager issue, it could be that the leader is not role modeling check-in. So then our HR business partners would work directly with that leader to figure out what is the right intervention to bring that leader on board as well as then the rest of their organization. So we're able to get a lot of great intelligence from that engagement survey. We also look at attrition as another way to see how check-in is working or not for us. You know, what groups are people leaving? Why are they leaving? So again, a lot of intelligence that can be um, gleaned from that process. And then we get a lot of anecdotal positive feedback. So once when I was speaking at a, at a class and I was mentioning that I had been on the check-in team to design check-in, um, afterwards, a manager walked up to me and he said, I could kiss you. Now, fortunately, he didn't, but he said, you know what? Every time that first email would come out about the annual review process, he said this dark cloud would come above my head and stay with me for the four months of that process. And it was just miserable. 
I love our new process so much better. I had another manager who said, you know, previously, if I wanted to give feedback to an employee as a way to help them and support them, then they would just freak out. Whereas now with check-in, it's expected. They know I'm going to give them feedback, both positive and constructive, and that's just expected. It's not like if I get feedback, that must be I'm doing really, really bad. No, this is just how we do business. Now, a couple of years ago, I did a webinar similar to this, and less than three hours after I finished the webinar, I got an employee, I got an email from an employee who is not at headquarters, who is deep in the organization that I had never met. And I want to read you what his email said. It said, Angela, I have a friend who works in talent management who recently saw you in a webinar where you presented the work you had done with check-ins here at Adobe. He posed a few general questions to me about my experience as an employee. I wanted to report to you that I was proud to let him know that the check-in system you have implemented here at Adobe is great. I feel like it is more effective and more efficient than annual performance reviews. The check-in conversations are more natural with my managers, and I am much more motivated by the process. Thank you for implementing good change like this here at Adobe. Regards. I want to ask you, when was the last time you got an email like that regarding your performance management approach? In all my years at Adobe, I had never gotten that before check-in, but this is a very, very common occurrence. Okay, so what are some of the change management strategies that we use that I believe was really crucial in helping us to design a process and an approach that was going to work for Adobe? Well, as I mentioned before, we involved our stakeholders throughout the design process in a very iterative approach, constantly tapping into them. What do they want? What do they need? Not what do we think they want to need, but what's truly going to be effective for them. And it wasn't a one and done. It was an iterative process to continue to refine, rethink our, our thinking, test with them, and continue to iterate. We also provided ongoing communication throughout that summer. So people knew change was coming, why were we changing, why were we making the changes that we were making, so that they could be along for that journey. We also leveraged the perspectives of a cross-functional team. I've talked about that. We had legal, we had employee communications, HR business partnering, HR systems, OD and learning, a lot of different perspectives to help us design a really holistic approach. And then we also partnered with our very, very talented brand marketing team. And then finally, we designed a really comprehensive and integrated plan around not only the communications, but also the training. We had, I believe it was like 18, 24 month training plan of how we were going to roll this out. We started at the very top with our executive team. We brought in an executive coach and he was the one who actually said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, this is your approach. It begins and ends with you. This is why it's important. This is what it looks like. And he worked with our executives first. Then we had him go and do trainings for our senior leaders. Same type of thing. This begins and ends with you. You have to role model this. It's not going to be successful. You're not going to just snap your fingers and suddenly it's going to work or it's just going to go away. This is really to help you own and drive business success. So it's important for you to adopt this, to speak to it, to role model it. And then we rolled out training to the rest of the organization. But we did it on an ongoing basis. So we started with the high level philosophy of check-in and then we went every quarter one of each of those three areas within the check-in approach. So we started with expectations for one quarter. Then the next quarter was around feedback. Then the next quarter was growth and development. And then we went back through each of those three, because we knew we had to really build the muscle in, in the organization in order to make this stick. Now, continuing to this day, we don't have as aggressive of a training process as we did then, kind of like what I consider weight loss, right? When you want to get to that ideal weight in that first year, you are going to go gun ho right? You're going to exercise five or six times a week. You're going to eat clean. You're going to drink all the water. You're going to do everything that you need to get to that ideal weight. And once you're there, you can't just go, okay, I'm done. You have to keep that pressure on the pedal even going forward. May not be as, as aggressive as in the beginning. Maybe you're exercising two to three times a week. Maybe you're having a cheat day here or there. But 
you have to continue to keep your eye on the ball. Same thing for us. In the beginning, full court press, lots and lots of training to build the understanding, the mindset, the skill in the organization. But then we continue to provide trainings throughout the year. We have about 4,000 new employees that started at Adobe last year. That's 4,000 new bodies that don't know anything about check-in. So we need to make sure that we're bringing them on board as well. But then also our existing employees, how do we help them to keep their skills strong and to keep this top of mind? So we've integrated check-in throughout our business practices and our people practices. So let me give you some examples. If you were to apply for a position here at Adobe, the recruiter would talk to you about check-in. And the hiring manager would also talk about their check-in approach. Once you start as an employee at new hire orientation, you'll get to hear about check-in and what does that look like and how you can leverage that in the first 90 days. If you're a new manager, it's woven into new manager orientation and it's also woven into our regular manager curriculum. On a quarterly basis, our HR business partners will work with our senior leaders in their all hands, as well as in their communications to weave in check-in and the themes. So we really want to make sure this isn't just a standalone process that sits over there in the corner. It's something that is a part of what we do and how we do it all the time. Now, again, one of my key things that I always come back to is check-in is not about the process. It's about the outcome. So we want timely, frequent, direct conversations that help to inform and empower our employees to do their absolute best to the organization and help to drive business success. And we want to keep it light and we want to keep it simple. So we've lived now with check-in for six years. And like I said, that's a long time. And it's been incredibly successful in helping us to continue to be successful and push the envelope in the market. And it's because we took the time at the front end in an iterative design process that really allowed us to evolve performance management to be a better approach that can be um, better for our business and better for our employees. There's still work to be done. I'll never say that it's done and it's over, but we will continue to build the capability and reinforce these concepts, and we truly believe that we're on the right path. Now, we often get requests to hear more about check-in. So if there's more questions that, we that you have, we'll take some here at the end of this webinar, but we have decided to open source check-in. We created a website that you can go to, www.adobe.com slash check hyphen in. And we posted our journey there. We posted a lot of the resources and documents that we use that you are welcome to go to your heart's content. Everything's there, everything you wanted to know and more about check-in. So let me leave you with this final thought. We often bemoan, where are the leaders of tomorrow? And why are our leaders today not stepping up to lead like we want and need them to do? I believe this goes way beyond performance management, and I challenge you to think bigger. Do your practices encourage leadership to take ownership and responsibility to truly lead and drive business success? Or are you unintentionally encouraging lazy and a lack, lazy behavior and a lack of accountability? Do your leaders get the support, the incentives, and the inspiration to be the leaders that you know they can become? Rather than focusing on just a framework or a process, I challenge all of us to think about how we build leadership into everything that we do. And by thinking creatively about the problems we need to solve, taking bold steps, and executing flawlessly, we can truly add value to the organizations that we support. I believe the future is ours to design, so I hope we can go and co-create it together. Thank you very much, and I'd be more than happy to take some questions now. All right, Angela, thank you so much for that. Uh, we have a lot of questions already in the queue, but if you have a question, please don't hesitate at all in submitting it. Just click on that Q&A icon on the right-hand side of your screen, type your question in, and click Submit. We're going to start with one here um, that came in from Stefan. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. 
Um, and we had a few that kind of are the same uh, here, and it's this one revolves around um, what the actual meeting and check-in discussion is. So the question from Stefan is, what does the actual check-in discussion or meeting look like? Is it a true coaching approach or more of a mentoring or a signing? I'm sorry, what was the last one? Coaching, mentoring, or what? In a, or more of an assigning. Assigning, like assigning of tasks? Yeah, Stephanie, you may, maybe submit a little bit of clarification, but yeah, I would think maybe something along those lines, Angela. Great question, Stefan. So we make the distinction between a one-on-one -on -one and a check-in. So a one-on-one -on -one is about the business. So, um, you know, what needs to get done, status reports, that type of thing. A check-in is about the individual. It's the intention of what does the individual need to be successful? So are there clear expectations, clear milestones? What does success look like? Getting very specific feedback on performance, either specific to the expectations or feedback around my last presentation or how I'm working with a teammate and growth and development. Now, I recognize there is some overlap between that, but we want managers to be thinking, I, I don't always want to be focusing on the business and the objectives of the business? Am I also with the intention of the employee and helping the employee to be successful? So in the best perfect world, I encourage managers have separate meetings. I know there's overlap and they kind of can go back and forth, but what can often happen is people snap to the business and the business updates. Be intentional and make sure that I'm also thinking about the employee and what do they need? So um, oftentimes managers will have a meeting, as an example, once a quarter that they actually call check-in. And that's to be like, okay, we have our weekly one-on-ones and we're talking about the business and I might give you feedback there and we may be talking about status to objectives, but this check-in is gonna be very specifically about making sure you have clarity of objectives for the quarter or the next business rhythm. Or I wanna give you some very specific feedback on areas that you've asked me to give you feedback on or it can be about development. We're gonna have a development conversation. We're gonna focus this check-in specifically on how you wanna to continue to grow and what does that look like. So um, like I say, I, the two can kind of, people can go back and forth. I know when I meet you know, with somebody on my team, um, it's easy to kind of go back and forth between the two, but we do ask managers to also be very intentional to making sure that they're allocating time to thinking about does the employee have what they need. We have a card that we give to our employees, our managers, to help them think about what are questions they can ask in each of these three areas that can be very specific about either expectations or feedback or growth and development. So we give that to them, again, keeping it light and simple. Each section has just a couple bullet points, a couple questions um, to make it just very, again, I go back to light and simple around that conversation. If you go to our check-in website, you will find that document that shows it's, um, it's a small card and it's got like the three pillars and then a few bullet points and questions for managers to have when they have a check-in with their employees. All right, Angela, thank you. Um, this one comes from Julie. Uh, Julie's question is, what was the timeline from when you started engaging people with the blog to the rollout? So it was, I believe, March or April of 2012 and we rolled out September, October of 2012. So it was about a six month process where we went through that iterative process where we would go to managers, leaders, the blog, and then back again. So it was about six months throughout that year. Now we didn't know exactly what the time frame was gonna be, um, but we felt like you know that was the right timing for us. We were making progress, we were making decisions, we were double clicking to what was needed to be done next. We didn't set out saying it's going to be six months, um, but that ended up what what was the right timing that made sense to get us to check in. All right, perfect. Um, and this one you may have touched on a little bit, but uh, this one comes from Nadia. Nadia's question is, since your process, since this process doesn't require consistent documentation, if there's a manager change, whether the manager leaves or moves to a new role, how does the information around a colleague's performance get to the new manager? Great question. I think it was Julie. So again, we are trying to, we want to work with professional adults. So we tell people, you know, 
at Adobe, there are changes all the time. We recommend that for your own records, you are tracking this information for you. But we are not going to take the time as a business to collect all of that for you. So knowing that your manager most likely will change in the next 6, 12, 18, 24 months if you're lucky, you should be documenting this, writing this down. It's up to you to take the ownership for that. So again, we're trying to build that sense of ownership, not just of our managers and our leaders, but even as the employees. So what should I be doing to make sure that I'm able to track the impact I'm making to the business, the feedback that I've gotten, the success that I've had, the accomplishments that I've had? You know, you should be tracking that for yourself. But that is not something that we are going to track for you. That process of collecting it all and keeping it in a centralized system takes enormous amount of time and there's very little benefit to the business. But as an individual, I would highly recommend that you do that so you have that on an ongoing ba basis. And should a manager change, when you get your new manager, you can then talk about, here's the successes I've had in the last 6, 12, 18 months. Here's what I'm working on. Here's the feedback that I have. Here's a development plan that I was working on. So again, it's, it's not putting all the onus on the managers and the leaders. We also believe that this was a shared accountability model. And that's part of what we train. We also do employee training on check-in is that you take ownership for this as well. You take ownership for your success. And part of that is check-in. All right. So since you mentioned training, that, that'll be a good uh, segue into this next question from Julie. Um, what was the change management approach and training pri provided to the managers and employees that made this process so successful? What was some of the change management that we did? Um, well, part of that was kind of that slide that I shared prior. So we had a lot of communication as we went through this process to let them know what was going to happen, why was it happening. Um, everyone could weigh in on that blog. So every employee in the organization had the opportunity to give their suggestions and to hear where we were along the journey. I'll have to admit there are many times when we go into our um, ivory tower in HR, we create our perfect plan and then we roll it out to the organization and then we're completely surprised why they don't adopt it immediately. Instead, let's encourage them to be part of that journey with us. Understand why are we changing? What are we changing? Give us ideas, co-create it with us. And I believe that made a huge change in the organization because people felt like they were heard they had the chance to weigh in. They had the chance to see what some of the other comments from other people were as well and to be a part of that journey. So I would say that was probably the number one thing that helped us to really create an approach that works for us here at Adobe. So really involve your stakeholders in an iterative process. Of course, you can't do a focus group with everyone. We're 18,000 employees across the globe. So we were very strategic around the people that we selected for those focus groups. But the blog gave us the chance to hear from every employee and for every employee to have a voice in that. And then that ongoing communication was really cr critical and key. And then uh, the other thing was, as we were starting to roll it out, we also had leaders speak to check in. So once we officially launched, um, each leader had an all hands meeting where they talked about, you know, here's our new performance management approach. It isn't something to be imposed on you as employees. This is to help you get what you need in order to be successful. Clear expectations, ongoing feedback, ongoing growth and development. And this is to really help you and us as leaders to be successful individually and successful as a collective unit. So I think that involvement, that communication, and then that enablement plan with the training was really important in order for us to be able to socialize it through the organization and then to allow for adoption to occur. All right, great. We're gonna move along. We still have a little bit of time. Uh, questions are still rolling in. We're probably not gonna be able to get to them all, but if you have one, please don't hesitate to submit it. This one comes from uh, Jaron. I apologize again if I mispronounce your name. How are you able to make L&D decisions for the organization based on the results of the, these development check-ins? Tell me that question again. How are we able to make decisions 
Tell me more. Yeah. So, so how do you come to how do you come to making these L and D decisions with the results of the development check-ins? Okay, I'm not 100 percent sure the question. To make what kind of decisions was it? To make the maybe move- changes or um, stuff like that. Um, let me let me sift through here. We got a ton of them coming in. I'm trying to keep track. I mean, I'm not sure this was the intent of the question, but some people have asked me before, like, how are we able to make such a significant change in the organization and have it adopted? And I think there were a couple things. One is Donna Morris, who is our executive vice president of customer and employee experience. She's very well respected, not only by our CEO, Shantanuna Ryan, but also by the executive team. So having that strong voice at the table and an advocate, that was critical. Um, having the executive team be involved in the design and that understanding that they owned it. It wasn't just something over there that HR was going to work on, but really adopting it as something for them and their businesses. That was critical. Um, so we were ripe for change given all of the changes going on in the organization. People hated the old approach. So they were really hungry for something better. So I think all the things were, all the elements were there in order for us to make a really, you know, quite radical change. You know, as I think about it, check-in is really radical. We got rid of a lot of the scaffolding, but it was all for the right reasons. And I think it was very well thought out. And again, because we didn't design in our ivory tower, we really asked for feedback. Um, People were then ready for change. They knew it was coming and they felt like they had a voice in that. So that did allow us to make these really dramatic decisions. If you don't have executive support, if the CEO doesn't think this is important, if you're not represented, if you're not um, respected as a function in the organization, it would be really hard to make the change like what we did. But we had all those elements in our favor and allowed us to make changes that I believe had supported the success that we've had in the business in the last number of years. Okay, you mentioned involving involving the employees in this process. So this one from Jennifer, what have you noticed as the impact on business results or productivity as a result of implementing this program and co-creating it with the employees? So the old process took a lot of time, and time is one of the most important resources we all have. And so there was this tax on the system by everyone putting all this time in writing the reviews and doing all the um, – Um, you know, all the meetings and the writing, all of that, all of that was time that was better spent putting into the business. Now, I don't see check-in as necessarily saving time for the managers because the managers are probably putting in the same amount of time, but it's spread out throughout the year as opposed to in a couple months of the year doing annual review. They're putting in the same amount of time, but it's more relevant It's more impactful. Employees are getting feedback that is actionable. So I think it makes, you know, that time is much better spent than it was in the past. So um, to me, that was really critical. Um, I just realized I forgot the question. Can you repeat the question again? Sure. Yeah. Uh, What have you noticed as the impact to business results or productivity as a result of implementing the program? Great. So, you know, it's, it's always hard to tie a one-to-one correlation. Because we changed check-in, it had directly this impact because there's a lot of things that have, gone, that have had to go well. But if you look at Adobe's business success in the last six years, as we've made this really difficult business transformation to the cloud, to a subscription model, we have had success after success after success in the last six years. I do believe that check-in is part of that success. We took away something that was dragging the business down because of the time that was invested. We were losing good people because of the old annual review process. People didn't like being labeled. And after annual review, we would see this huge spike in attrition. We no longer see that spike in attrition because we don't have the annual review process. So we were pushing people out because of a bad process. So I do believe that Um, We've gotten rid of a lot of the negative factors that were actually negatively impacting our business. We were still successful in the past, but that success has been accelerated. And I believe it's allowed employees to get feedback in the moment that allows them to shift and pivot faster to make greater impact to the business, better alignment, 
to our overall cascade of objectives to be able to continue to grow. So there's a lot of things that we are continually measuring, attrition, promotion rates, all of that continues to be very strong. We continue to be a great place to work. And we work really hard for that. Um, and I think check-in is really a part of that story and part of that narrative. Okay. And in here, you just kind of touched on a couple of the advantages as well. But this comes from Brian. Uh, I understand why managers and leaders didn't look forward to the annual performance evaluation process. So what are some specific advantages to the check-in that employees themselves have identified? Mm -hmm. So employees are getting feedback much more frequently than they ever did. Now, I will be honest, everyone still says they still want more feedback, which is good. And we're continuing to drive that and continuing to train on that. Um, but employees will say they didn't like the, the annual performance review conversations either. I mean, honestly, anyone we talked to, everyone like hated, and I don't use the word hate very, um, very easily, but Leaders hated the process, managers hated the process, employees hated the process, we hated the process, and it was our process. So, you know, why keep it when it wasn't working? And I think part of that was fear. We didn't know what plan B was. So in the absence of an option, we kept something that was very, very um, pulling the business down. So what we find, what we hear from employees is they can have more frequent, honest dialogues with their managers Managers are expected to have conversations more frequently. They're getting more feedback than they used to. In fact, um, I have, we just finished our latest um, annual engagement survey and we had the question, uh, my manager gives me constructive feedback and that number is at 79% across the globe. Still means there's opportunity to grow, but I would say that's pretty awesome. I mean, my guess is not many people, you know, in previous years past, that number wasn't nearly as high. So people are getting more feedback than, um, than they did previously. And that's something that people really crave. We hire really smart, ambitious people who want to know that what they're doing is making an impact. So getting the feedback, while it isn't always nice and rosy, but knowing that it's in their best interest to help them do their best work, people really appreciate that. So we, like I say, a lot of it's anecdotal. We get survey data. We're also looking at it, you know, as I mentioned, at the manager level, at the, you know, organizational level, all of these numbers, and then providing the appropriate interventions to continue to support the business around check-in. Um, but we continue to hear from feed, from employees that they um, like their check-in conversations better than annual review. They hated annual review. This is much better. They're having conversations more frequently. They're getting feedback more frequently, and their managers are more focused on their growth and development than they were in the past. All right, uh, Angela, I think that's going to be all the time we have. We didn't even scratch the surface on these questions. We had a lot of them come in. They are uh, documented, though. So everybody in the audience, we really appreciate your participation. We really appreciate you, Angela, for taking the time and being here with us today. Um, it's greatly appreciated. I also want to thank today's sponsors of this Spotlight webinar at uh, Cornerstone On Demand. Um, we do a lot of work with Cornerstone, and we really appreciate uh, them sponsoring today's event. If you enjoy the event, please take the time to fill out our post-event survey, which is going to appear right as this webinar ends. Your feedback is very important to us, and it does help us improve our future events. In the meantime, though, um, please don't hesitate to register for our next CLO webinar, which will actually take place tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, titled The Imperative to Build a Resilient and Agile Organization One Mindset at a Time. Thanks again to Angela, everybody on the line, and Cornerstone. We'll see you all next time, and have a great day. Bye, everyone.